We are here for the Nate Bargazzi episode of a great listening experience. We're about to bring him on. Tom and I wanted to do a quick intro to say, first of all, Nate, huge deal. Uh, our special on Netflix after his half hour special on Netflix and all the appearances on The Tonight Show. He also his, he has a famous bit about tigers that precluded Tiger King. Uh, and then a great bit about um, another famous bit about the Serpentarium in Wilmington, which I've been to. Um, so I'm excited to have Nate Bargazzi on the pod, calling us from Nashville. Um, and Tom, we, we finally have Patreon episodes now. We have uh, one on Tiger King, and we have one uh, coming out shortly on you coaching me through Indian food. And then our third one is going to be my unified theory of comedy. So Now's the chance to uh, get in on those Patreon episodes. What do you say, Tom? I say it's the deal of the century. You just have to give any amount of money on Patreon. Just sign up. You can sign up for a dollar if you want, and uh, you get this incredible, wonderful content. And uh, it will never go on the free feed. So if you want to hear it, got to pony up. And we're, and, we're, and we're also trying to make each episode a little unique, a little different, so that you get a little mix of different things in there. Um, and I, may I just add one more thing? Sure. If there's something that you're itching for us to discuss or an activity you want us to do on the air, our ears are open, our inboxes are open. Please tell us and we will provide. Oh, yeah. We're, we, already are, we already did the request from my mom on the Indian dish. Boom. Uh, okay, so Nate Bargazzi, awesome. He, uh, big following, Tom. What do you say? Should we bring him on? Let's bring him on. I can't wait to meet the man himself. All right, here it is. Here's the Nate Bargazzi episode. A great listening experience with Joe Zimmerman. Please welcome your host, Joe Zimmerman. Nate, good to see you, buddy. How are you, man? Are you in? Uh, are you? Are you in Nashville right now? I am. We're in Nashville. I live here, and uh, so we've been. I mean, you know, been here since March. I got home like the 12th or 13th of March, and then, uh, and then this, and here we are. You, so this you were, you were out on the road on the day it happened, Tom Hanks day. The Tom Hanks day. Yes. I was doing a show in, I was in Red Bank, New Jersey, and, uh, we did a show the night before and, and then in Wilkes bar, Pennsylvania, oh, yeah. Wilkes-Barre, I don't know. Wilkes-Barre. So, yeah. Wilkes-Barre. And they, uh, we were doing the show there and, uh, it was like starting to kind of happen. Like all the stuff was getting canceled a little bit. And then we went, uh, we drove to Red Bank and we just assumed, you know, it was just like all, like, it's been pretty crazy. Like how much information is like just changing daily with this. And like in that day, it was hourly. Like I was, you know, I was trying to talk to my agents or managers just to be like, what are we doing? No one was canceling. Uh, our show, like, you know, the governor of New Jersey was like just recommending that shows with, you know, under a hundred people or a hundred people gatherings or something. So the dude didn't want, like the, the guys didn't want to cancel, but I was getting a lot of messages of people like not wanting to come and stuff or being nervous. And then there's people that was already driving there. And so it just, you know, I just didn't want, I think the biggest risk I was looking at was like, I don't want to like do the show. And then if people didn't want to come they don't get a refund or something because they could, because Ticketmaster could be like, well, they did the show. It was your choice. And so the only way to handle all of it, the only way to make myself a hero was to reschedule the show. It was interesting how many people kind of wanted to be heroes and then that melted away. Like I was due to do, I was due to be a judge at a comedy spelling bee in Atlantic City in the last week of March. And they were like, we're doing it fuck it we're doing it mm. and then the nba canceled their season <laughs> and then i got a very sheepish text message yeah. the next day yeah we're, we're, we're done we're, we're done we're not going ahead of the nba we're done yeah on yeah. march 12th on the march 12th the seller was still doing spots and so i just i went in and uh i rode a bike into the city I like this will be safe and then uh and then just put a little cover they put little covers over the mics and the audience was you know, split up 50, 50% capacity. And I was like, I guess we're just going to do this for the next three months. And then the next day, everything was canceled. 
But yeah, that was they, the time they were only doing fit. They were doing fifty percent capacity on that twelfth. Like they just cut it down. Uh, yeah, on the on the tenth, eleventh, twelfth, they cut it down to fifty percent. I think they might have cut it down to thirty percent around the twelfth. And I'm like, I guess this is just going to be the new norm the next month. And then the next day, all businesses closed for eight weeks. <laughs> yeah, crazy. But, dude. but yeah, that that those first five to those first seven days in a row, it was like a month's worth of changes per day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they were. I like that. Like, uh, just I, like some places were just like. 2020 it's all done and you're like well let's just wait and see like you know and then some i mean like there's like some i feel like there's states where like their governors are like yeah we're canceled for you know six seven eight months and you're like let's just wait and see like you know let's just see let's not just jump jump way ahead and be gone but you know i I like the overreaction that's a very comedic like comedians like you know where it's like just uh like my wife always gets mad, like is everything's exaggerated, you know. If we get in a fight, like I can just the next words out of my mouth are just like, yeah, well maybe we should just leave each other. Like and it's like it's not even to that point, like. <laughs> but I just I'll leap to that level of like, well I guess I'm gonna start looking up apartments now. And she's like, what? Like. So, uh, you let me, well, did that feel weird to have, um, you know. 2000 people or whatever's health risk. And then you have to make the decision. Cause you made the decision. It was, on the fear, I just right? thought it was like, yeah, I thought it was, I thought that someone would do it. I, I, I thought like, I kept like thinking like, you know, I was kind of, we were there and then we were just, we went and walked to go eat and then it was weird. And uh, I kept like kind of looking at like Twitter and just Googling like New Jersey's governor, you know, it's like, I'm in, I don't know their governor and stuff like so i and like looking up like just what's going on in that city and like they uh and then it started just getting to that point and we were so close to showtime that and then i started getting a bunch of messages you know because you get i get the messages like they're i mean i know they call the venue and stuff and that that's the one thing that made me mad with the, ven- the venue is like when people called they're like well nate canceled and it was like it's a crazy pan you know like it's it's not like it was like just like raining and they they didn't want to <laughs> get out. It was, it's like a historical thing. Like you know, who knows what to do? Uh, so yeah. it was. I thought it was weird. It was. I actually felt very alone out there. Like it felt. It was very funny. Like to be even my with managers and agents. I mean, they were supportive of when we did the decision, but it's like they were kind of guiding me through it. But it just felt like no one was going to make this decision. And it was either going to be a decision of like, it was almost like there was, if we would have done the show and someone got sick in that show, I would have been blamed for it. Cause I would have been the one that made the decision versus, and also being the one to make the decision to cancel. Like, the, you, yeah. you know, we're in a business where we don't really have a boss. Like, so we're kind of the thing. So like your name is the thing when, you know, if, when we're people can get refunds, if they can't make the rescheduled date and it's been weird. Some, some of these venues, in other places or Ticketmaster, they make it tough on people trying to get these refunds. Obviously, I want everybody to have a refund. I don't want to take anybody's yeah. money. I have no desire to do that. But it's hard to say that because then they just know your name. And they're like, well, you, want, you won't give me my refund. It's like, yeah, dude, I'm not in – you know, it's like all these – like the Los Angeles Lakers aren't in charge of their ticket sale. Like it's – you know, there's like right. staples. Lebr- there's just a million people involved. LeBron's not holding their holding their uh, their uh, courtside pass money. It'd be weird to um, like tweet yeah. at LeBron and say like, "I ordered a large nachos last night and I only got a medium." Like, where, where's can I can What's I get my three dollars back? Yeah. So, um, so I I, I want to get into uh, the sports with you and your predictions because it's crazy. Uh, this is the podcast where uh, I try to attain genius. Um, so you're the, and Tom already has it. So you're the guest where I try to get a little <laughs> bit of genius from. Um, and, uh, so we like to, we like to let the audience get to know you in like a 20 second bang by, uh, deciding what your love language is. Do you know it? Okay. My love language. Do you know what your uh, love language? 
quality time, physical touch, is. words, affirmation. Uh, oh, like what I, uh, I would say, uh, I don't know, dude, I've never thought of it. Uh, what is acts your love language? Acts of service. Uh, I am a words of affirmation, uh, physical touch. I'm straight uh, acts of service all the way in both directions, giving and receiving. Usually the usually the materialistic yeah. people are more are gift gift giving and receiving. Maybe you're maybe you're into gifts. Uh yeah, I think I mean I, I think I could be. I mean, even though you're making fun <laughs> of me in that statement. I I'm more I think I, I do like to uh I would rather give someone something. I would rather I don't really want anything. I would just rather I would rather give to someone else. I like to my what I love is to give to someone and then like not be, you know, involved in it. Like not have to, you know, like if you ever donate money to GoFundMe, it's like be anonymous. I'm always anonymous. Oh. Don't ever put your name down. Nice. Yeah, it's not about, it's not about the reward. Yeah. I, but I'll tell you, I'll tell, let me tell you who I've do, uh, donated to. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, I like, I've noticed from your, from your comedy, from the Tennessee Kid Netflix special, some of your bits involve you preferring to sort of stay back in the shadows. So it's sort of yes. funny. It's sort of funny that I'm a little bit similar. It's funny that you chose stand up where you just have to be in front of everybody and them staring at you. It's true. I know. Well, you know what I think it is? It's the because we want to be in the shadows, but we still want the control. So it's almost like in in this way we have complete control and it's like well you got to just sacrifice you just got to get over the fact that you got to be in front of everybody where you know like acting or that stuff i mean there's there's just a zoo of people that are involved and when i first started i did improv at the very beginning and i just remember being like i don't want to i don't want to be like you know like these other people are not funny or something and i don't want to have to be traveling down this road that they want to go down and so you want to do it yourself so you just have to get you know it's yeah yeah it's the opposite of improv it's the opposite of improv you're like i'm in control of uh everything i like being the the control yeah do you ever feel like up there you know when you're um, on stage like uh it is very funny though you do not have you, you have no moment to yourself on stage do you ever find little weird moments like I don't know if you like look down and that's just a brief, like, Oh, like you can, you feel like you can breathe for, I mean, a split second, you know, like musicians, they can go to the bathroom. Like a band will be like, I'm going to the bathroom during a song and in stand up, it's the most focus on anything. I think in any entertainment, the, it's the longest stretch that you, you have. You that's know, there's why, no music, there's no lights, there's it's just boom. That's why if it's a really hot crowd that's laughing a lot, it makes the show so much easier because you get moments to yourself when they're laughing. Yeah. Yes. Like, oh, you do. I can breathe for a second. Oh, yeah. And the, I mean and in and in a lot of other art forms, like a quiet moment can actually be good in like, oh, it's building tension. Yeah. Like when that concert pianist sits down at the piano and just it's complete silence and they're just kind of gathering themselves before they play Beethoven. It's like, oh, we're about to see some Beethoven. Oh, yeah. wow. But when a comedian stops talking, it's like, what's wrong? Yeah. Something's yeah. gone terribly wrong. I always never tried my big comedy uh, that I've, how when I write comedy, what I do, I try not to be too far from a laugh because it's like you just can't and even though silence is good like sometimes when you're saying something interesting it is very nice to hear but be quiet uh but you got to know that you have their attention but I, you just try to be so near laughs because you it's yeah it gets too weird dude if you don't have some kind of laughter going like some kind of rhythm it gets real uncomfortable and then yeah if it's too long you feel like people are like this guy where's he going with this so you get your little break when you take a sip of your sparkling water uh, I, yeah, I do. I've never, I might be fancy, but I'm not a, I'm not a sparkling. I would drink straight up Diet Coke on stage. But they, that's, your, that's your peace, peace moment. I have water. You know what? I've drank more water recently than I ever have. I used to, I, you ever remember you take, you take bottles on stage and you're doing 10 minutes and you're like, 
dude, you don't have time to drink water. Like, I would see people, or people take their beers in New York. They'd always, like, you take your beer on stage, and you're like, what are you, are you going to be to drink your beer? Like, you have 10 minutes to do your act. You can't, it's, you know, you got to have, you got to be on stage for an hour to, like, have, to be thirsty, to want to, you know, do it. I do have I do have a, a I do have the place where I get a break. Um, when there's a check drop, I will do like one crowd work bit, about thirty minutes mm -hmm. into the show. And uh, the moment I ask somebody a question, I like sigh a sigh of relief while they're yeah. answering. You're one hundred percent right. <laughs> You're 100 that's a great right. that's a great way to get a break, dude. Like that's true. Crowd work, asking someone a question. And just feel, you just feel the eyes get off of you. It's just a, I don't know what it is, but you just, you just, you know, it's just like a moment of just, whew. and the crowd works a great way to do it. Cause you just throw it on, make them feel it. You know what I mean? That's part of, um, part of why I've been like surprisingly, um, guiltily enjoying this pause where I'm forced to stay home is that I just feel like I get this break from people staring at me. Yeah. <laughs> are you, are you, um, have you found yourself, uh, have you found anything about yourself that you've been surprised about during this time? You know, I, I wrote a little bit more. I'm not a big, uh, I never sit down and write. Uh, not, I would always just do it on stage, you know, not like that's just the way, I think it's the way you do it when you're in New York and stuff a lot more because you can get on stage so much. So, you know, you type your ideas down, maybe in your phone, but I don't ever hash it out. Uh, but I've, I've written a little bit. I've had a couple of times where I've like, you know, like end up just sitting down and you write some ideas down. Uh, and I, so it's like, I, 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 I feel like I've been creative, which has been good. I've enjoyed doing these kind of things. Like, uh, you know, it's not like I've been overwhelmingly doing them, but it's enough to like still be funny. And so that's good. Um, uh, I've, I've golfed a lot, actually. They, they haven't. I mean, it's been so, a ton. So, so you, so you haven't, you have it to me, it sounds like you haven't really changed that much as a person. You're continuing to be the same person, which is writing comedy and playing golf. I mean, so I put, here's how, like I, I said, you know, I think as, comedians were very obsessed people like uh and that's how we even get to where we're at is is you have to have an obsessiveness to want to get better and if you're any relaxed at all you're going to get passed by and so you have to be very obsessed and that was Tom's since all problem. the focus yeah 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 <laughs> the the only thing is uh so with with comedy gone now i've obsessed uh, i've put all the obsession session into golf and so i've shifted it all because i can feel oh, sometimes when I, if I have a month sometimes if i have a month off i can feel that like i'll, I'll start you know you start feeling down like you just get kind of i don't know you're like depressed but you just get a little like when you're like you ever get a month off when you're not touring or something and then towards the end of it you get real antsy and you're like ah, i gotta get out like i gotta start doing something so with this being, this is going to be, you know, five months, six months or whatever it is. Yeah, I'll lose. I'm going to go nuts if it doesn't happen. So it's like been just trying to focus it, all of it into this. And I mean, I've gone crazy with it. Well, having played um, a lot of golf as a junior and then college golf, um, golf is one of the most obsessive games there is because there's so many little facets of it you can you could be working on. Oh, it's nuts, dude. I watch YouTube videos all night long. I mean, I, it's golf 24 hours. It's just, it's, uh, it's exhausting. It's not, you know, it's, I mean, but I love it. You know, I always say that golf's a great sport for your, like for what we do, like, because it's like, when you go do it, it's four hours of just your mind focused on golf. So you're not thinking of, you're not like out there, like thinking about your career or like what, anything else. It's like all that stuff's kind of the same because golf is such a focus driven sport and you have to be in the right mindset for it. 
So it's a great sport to, if, you know, if someone had, if someone lived a very stressful life, it's like, go do golf, dude, like focus everything on golf. I know it's like, I know golf can be stressful, but it's at least, it takes your mind. You can't like make your mind just shut off. So you got to just redirect it. It's almost a weird sort of time warp where when I play now, which is very rare, I disappear for like five hours into the golf round. And I'm often very frustrated and anxious throughout the golf round. So it doesn't feel like a vacation. But then when I come out of it, I feel like I just came out of a different world back into the world. It does give you. You do. Yeah. It gives you a nice break. It gives you a nice break. You feel very loose. Like, uh, yeah, it, it is like that. You go to it. Just all your problems are kind of gone. I mean, you got problems more directly in front of you with like golf. <laughs> and so you're focused on these problems. It can be very frustrating. But like, you know, when people would always say like they do it for like business meetings and stuff like that. I never understood. Yeah. It was like, I, you don't, it's not like, like, I mean, you sit there and talk and stuff, but I don't like, I can't imagine like having to do some kind of deal like as yeah. you're playing, like. You would have to be unbelievably good that you could goof off and just not care, you know, otherwise. You're Are like, either of you like that guy who's just waiting for the dude to show up with the beer in the little cart? You you both sound super intense, like you wouldn't drink on a round. Uh, yeah, I'm a Gatorade I'm, guy. Yeah, I, uh, I did, I mean, I'm not drinking now, and so I'm not doing it, but I've never really drank on a golf course. I never... You know, I sometimes I it looks I get that it's fun. The only time I would have ever done it is if I was playing like a scramble where you're playing with like three other guys and you're on a team and it's not really the pressure's not on you. Uh, so hey, I've never, yeah, I never drink. I'm trying to get better. So it's like you just your focus has to be on that so much. Yeah, you're in it. It's like it's like all of a sudden your stress about taxes goes to the out of bounds markers on number five. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. So I'm curious, two things. Uh, I still feel like nobody has, well, first of all, you play, I saw you played with Jason Day. You played one yeah. round with Jason Day, for, who's the, one of the top guys, uh, top five I guys played, on I tour. I think I played, I, played three, I played three with him now. That's amazing. He's top five in the world. He won, uh, I believe, the U.S. Open two years ago PGA. in Wisconsin. The PGA Championship. Yeah, that was a fun one to watch. Uh, so it's, you, it's, it's often amazing to see people play up close that are that good and hit it that far. Um, did you, did, was there anything playing with him that you learned or were surprised about? I, you know, he does his routine every time. So even when we're just playing, a, I mean, he's just goofing off. I mean, he's not goofing off. Like the day, last time I played with him, uh, one was at Mirfield which is a big uh, memorial tournament in Columbus, Ohio. And then we played at a place he plays in Palm Springs. And I played two days with him. And we were with his caddy and his uh, swing coach. So they're all from Australia and just great dudes. It was like a – that was a very fun hang. And they, his swing coach was, like, helping me. And, like, you know, uh, Jason's just a great – he's a really great dude, man. Like, He's very funny. Like, you know, he's got a great laugh, like very relaxed. Like you don't feel, you know, when he's got to, when he's got to get focused in a tournament, he can get focused, but his whole family, you know, I've become friends with his family and his wife. And like, I mean, they're all just wonderful people. And like, uh, so it's fun to get to, but when you go play with them, I mean, everything's great. Every shot's great. You know, I've got to play with a few, I play with Tony Fee now and he's another one that's great and just bombs it. Uh, and then I played with just some Vandy, uh, some Vandy golf guys, this guy, Will Gordon and John Augustine and the John Augustine's going to be in a senior year and he's playing in the U S open and the masters as an amateur this year. And I played with him up at Vanderbilt. He's, I mean, he's, you know, one of the, he's probably top three, five college golfers in the world right now. And then he'll eventually turn pro and Will Gordon is a uh, pro. He's already turned pro and trying to get his card. And Will Gordon's maybe the longest out of all of them. Wow. Everybody that I've played with. Those are and some he, long hitters I mean, his you've bo- played with. Uh, it's, yeah. Will Gordon hits at 330, 340. Like, it's nuts, dude. Like, it's a, it's, it's a wild uh, it's a wild group. I've had a run of crazy. So, I'm playing with a lot of veins. So, locally, 
So just to clarify, in the golf courses in Nashville, they've done all the right things. In fact, that the cups are upside down now. They turn them upside down, so the ball only goes half, half like it kind of sits on the lip. So you never touch the flag. There's no rakes. Mm-hmm. You can't go inside. You can only if you drive a cart. It's single riders. Golf is like a perfect, you know, virus sport. Yeah. Like in the fact that there's that. The, so, but I've got to play with. So I played with a lot of like Van, Mike Yashimsky, who plays for the San Francisco Giants. He played with Mookie Betts, who's uh, from here. Oh, wow. uh, so and Kurt Casale and Sonny Gray, all these Vandy baseball players that I've got to know. And they're very fun to play with, too, because they bomb it as well. You know, Mike Yashimsky is like, I mean, he's a hitter for the Giants. And, I mean, dude, he just, like, I don't know, just they know how to they know how to swing, like, move their hips correctly. And, I mean, it's all of them are very, very long. And it's 300-plus yeah. yards. Anybody who, says, anybody who says golf's not a sport, you always find that the best athletes – tend to be the best golfers and there's a reason for that because it's a very athletic move the swing is a very athletic move to be good at it but um all that pre-shot that that's that's interesting you said jason day always does his pre-shot because so much of golf tom if you didn't know this you you do the exact same pre-shot routine before every single shot and the concept is that under great amounts of pressure you'll just be in your rhythm and you'll never change and um I think that's made me obsessed later in life of always trying to get my day started right with the perfect morning routine. Do you ever, do you ever focus on routines about your life outside of golf? I don't, I can somewhat have a routine before a show. Like when I get ready, uh, you know, just like when I go take, I take a shower and then I have like, I usually drink an iced coffee and I like to have it, especially now doing what you do in these theaters, I do that before a sound check, then go back and take a shower and then get to the show, then get back to the theater, like basically right when the show is starting. And so I kind of like to do that little routine. I'm not a, not a crazy routine guy. Uh, you know, speaking of golf routine, not the uh, one Phil Mickelson, he goes yeah. around and hits like three foot putt circles and when he does it, he's got to hit 100 in a row. So he counts one, two, and he just steps and goes around the circle, then puts them all back out and keeps going around till he makes 100 in a row. So when he putted to win the Masters, before he puts the ball, he stands, at the, he stands next to it and goes 89 and does his swing and then steps in the ball and goes 90 for his final shot. And it's putting himself back into that practice routine. And if you watch him, you see him, he does a, he does a putt, and then he steps into the ball and then puts it in because they, he, wow. just, he, put, he brought himself back to that practice routine. So he felt like even though it's this this putt, uh, you know, to win. I don't, I don't think it's the one of them. His first one, he was a long putt that he made to win the Masters. But some of the other ones he's done. And when I watched, they were re-showing when Tiger won. You get, He's doing it everywhere. And you could see that's what Phil did with three-foot putts is he took a step and then stepped into it. And it's just to put him back into that uh old routine which is pretty interesting yeah because tom if you don't know this uh so much of golf is like the little nerves in your hands can make the shot go horribly wrong (laughs) whereas other other sports it's not as nerve based and even comedy like if i'm in a horrible mood when i go on stage it doesn't really matter but when i if i'm in a bad mood before a golf shot that shot is inevitably going to be terrible so so uh yeah, it, it's like it, it's the ultimate mental game where you have to um, become super chill and relaxed no matter what the circumstances. So that's interesting. You got to not be tense. You got to have – it's like a weird – you know, that's why guys that are can hit at 340 yards, they can be 5'8 and weigh 135 pounds. And then they, you can have like a J.J. Watt who said like who's – 250 pounds of just muscle and he can't hit a driver remotely as far as that tiny kid can because that kid, he just knows how to be it's it's such an interesting thing like he just knows how to whip it through and you know and gets major it just bombs off is there doping in golf people accuse tiger of doping but i don't yeah. think vj think... singh had something 
But then DJ Singh was like a 50 year old dude. Like he's not, he didn't dope. I think the only doping he might've gotten in trouble for was like, just if they had an injury to get back quicker. But, you know, guys are lifting weights and stuff now. I bet there could be a point where that comes into play. Just because if someone knows, you look at like a Brooks Kepka now, these guys are kind of big and they know how to hit the ball. Uh, so maybe it could come into play. I, I don't think anybody is right now, but like, who knows, in 20 years, if dudes are just ripped. I mean, Tiger kind of started that trend of uh, working out. What about the other way? Like, you could gobble down a bunch of beta blockers to be super calm and that's, like not let yeah. the nerves get to you. That's more what you need for golf. I wonder if people do beta blockers. Because they do yeah. test for that in the, in the Olympic Games. Like, you know, people in, in like shooting and archery. That's a, you know, you get you get dinged for that. You know, they oh, wow. Really? For ba- yeah. Really? Oh, wow. 100%. Yeah, yeah. Ah, that's crazy. You know what? I thought of that today. Today, I thought I was like, "What if you took a like a beta blocker?" I mean, I like when I was golfing. Like, I was like, "Man, what if you did that?" I was like, "I bet that could be a good idea because it would keep you calm." Oh, man, I had no idea that me. you could even test for that. That would have helped me so much to have beta blockers in college golf. I was so nervous. Yeah. Wait. So I feel like I haven't got a chance to talk to anybody about how insane it was that Tiger came back and won. The uh, won the Masters last year after ten years of being injured. I feel like Tom Tom was nonplussed. Yeah, it was like it's the just, greatest. It's com- just not my game. It was like I the mean, greatest like, comeback in sports that I'm aware of. I I'm I I was very impressed when you told me how impressed I should be. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, then, then I I I didn't want to yuck your yum. Like you were really excited, and I was very thrilled for you. But it was like telling me someone just won the world checkers championship. Were you, <laughs> Nate? Were you were you going nuts watching the Tiger Masters last year? Nuts. I mean, I've, I rewatched it when they re-aired it recently. <laughs> the whole. I mean, I've watched I've watched his 2005 one. I watched his 1997. I've watched the whole round, his old final round, uh, which crazy is his 2005 one's crazy. It's Chris DeMarco it had back back to back years where he finished second uh, to Phil and Tiger. But uh, yeah, I watched. I woke up. It was very. They did it very early because of weather, and so it came on, and I sat and watched it. And I mean, I could have cried. I almost cried uh, when he won. I mean, it was that much. I mean, Tiger. You know, something I debated with my friends is like Tiger or Jordan as far as like who was who's more accomplished. And because they're both the basically the same name recognition. I mean, Jordan has been around. He's got shoes. So that's such a that's probably a bigger thing. Uh, but Tiger and Jordan, you know, the debate that debate is who which one of them are bigger. I mean, you know, it's like that's Jordan. I mean, Tiger's run in the 2000s when he won all the majors. Tiger, I watched more of. Like you gotta remember, Jordan's beginning of his career, and I'm I'm 41, but I I wasn't really aware. You know, I knew Jordan, but like when it was 90, 91, like you know, I'm I'm like 10, 11 years old. I'm not watching the finals at that time. But Tiger, I was 97 as when I graduated high school. So Tiger, I like very much set and watched his full career. T- Jordan's, I kind of watched the very the last like you know, five, six years, which were his biggest years. Uh, but watching that, like, you know, I don't know. Yeah. It was yeah. the Tigers thing was unreal, dude. I mean, it's it a, was, it, it's a mind. Um, it's a mind uh, freak for me because same, I, I'm 38. So I've watched, I feel like I've been watching Tiger my entire life now. Like mm-hmm. it's just strange that he can be good for my entire life. <laughs> To be that dominant, I mean, you know his handicap. Uh, they said like in 2000, if so, they give handicaps for. I'm, I assume no one knows that. Like no one cares about any of this, but handicaps is uh, my handicap is I'm I'm like a uh, 5.5 right now, and so that's I'm like fine. Like I'm I'm better than most, but I'm still not I'm not breaking par. I'm not like it's another level. So then you get to scratch, which is zero. And then the pros start getting at plus. So plus one, plus two. And, uh, and like when his best round golf, Tiger was a plus 10, which is unheard of. Like that's no one's that's it's beyond nuts. So for him, uh, an average how performance, good of a golfer he is an average performance that 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 statistic means that an average performance for him is that he birdies more than half the holes. That's average. Yeah. 
at his average. average. So if the par is 72, yeah. on average course, the par is 72, 62 is what's almost expected of him, which is yeah. nuts, which is nuts. So they had to make extreme. So at the hardest, they make extremely hard courses where a zero handicap would shoot 78. He's still shooting 68. Wait, are all the golf courses 72s? A lot is that of them. No, the there's rule? 71, 70. 72s are the most common. 72 is where it usually shakes out. Okay, right. I'm, 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 all right, I'm good. I've learned that. Uh, so are you caught up on the, um, are you caught up on the Jordan uh, documentary? I am. I mean, I, tonight I'll watch tonight. Uh, but besides that, I, yes, I'm all, all caught up. It's been amazing. I do think that's an interesting, uh, I do think that's an interesting debate, Tiger, Jordan. They they do seem like they brought similar attention and to each sport and got a similarly. They're like Babe Ruth. Fingers. I mean, like you got to look. Yeah, you look at Muhammad Ali, Babe Ruth, Tiger. Uh, you know, probably Gretzky. You know, Jordan. It's these these names of people that are as famous as you know. Even if you don't know never watched a second of golf you've heard of tiger woods you've heard of michael jordan you've heard of muhammad ali like they're just names are they're above every you know everything i, I never i and never really like i never really felt like i liked michael jordan because i was always aware of him being kind of cold-hearted and kind of mean and kind of seemed capitalist uh but watching this Jordan documentary, I've been like so pumped up every single episode to see how hard he works and then how amazing he plays. To see him, to see him look amazing against Larry Bird and Magic Johnson when he's like 23 years old, it's so fun to watch. Now, but I just have to interject here. Joe, you know that this documentary is like the kind of North Korean propaganda version it's, of his life. It's the propaganda version, yeah, I know. Yeah. It's the pro- right, okay. It's the propaganda version for sure, but it's still it's working on me. Still, it's, it's worth it. Yeah. Cuz I worth- need you guys to I need you guys to explain something to me. I've, obviously I'm not from the United States originally. The delta, the difference between uh how great this man was in his sport and how much of a jerk he seems to have been in his personal life, in the mass media age, like I am astounded that he's as beloved as he is because everyone seems to like admit on some level that he's a bad man, but it's still like, yeah, but you should have seen it. Like, everything, every, it's excused, like, it's immediately excused. And I just wonder, I, I just I need you guys to talk to me about Michael Jordan and how you feel about him. I have a theory, my theory on why it's excused is because. The, 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 the thing goes, if you want to be the best, if you want to be the greatest, if you're that competitive, that means you have killer instinct and that drives you to be the greatest, sort of. But no, no one says that about Gretzky. They love him. And nobody says that about LeBron. LeBron's great and he's not a jerk to people. Right. So what do you think? But they, but they argue with, I mean, but that's why Jordan is, you could argue Jordan's above both of them. You could, yes. And that's like, you know. I mean, I've argued for LeBron. I think LeBron. I get. I get very upset because I think a lot of Jordan lovers like dismiss LeBron, like he's not even in the conversation. And that's all. It's like that's all I'm ever saying is like, I think Jordan's above LeBron, but like, let's not like act like LeBron's not in this conversation. Like, and that's what they do. They just they just take it to a level of like they put LeBron like fourth on their list, and you're like, well, now you're not even. We're not even having a conversation because you're you're being unreasonable. Because yeah. you just don't you don't like that he's that close to being it's, compared. It's like right wing versus left wing. Listening to people argue about LeBron versus Michael. Yeah, yeah, it's very just they Politics. can't have one or the other. But I, I think with Jordan, I, him being a jerk is like he was just very competitive and like he wanted more out of his people. And I think it's hard for you know I, I'm sure every, I'm sure Albert Einstein would have been unreasonable because it's like the, when they're working on this, when someone's great, I think they have trouble not understanding how you are not with them. You're not at their level and they have trouble not like getting like, what do you mean you don't get this? And so when Jordan would argue and fight, he was trying to make the team better. And, you know, as it showed in some of this, when he goes, when he first gets to the bulls and all those players are partying and they're just having a good time, uh, 
he wants them to work hard and do what they want to do. I mean, he wants to win. And that's why you're they're playing, and that's where he thought he was playing. So, like, him being a jerk, like, you know, I mean, he was, like, super competitive and, like, I, I you know, I don't uh, – let me, let me throw something out there just to stir the pot. Isn't he the Trump of sport? Like, when – like, isn't the real him, like, when he went and had that, like, Hall of Fame induction speech and he, he used it as an opportunity to settle scores and, like, trash his high school coach for leaving him out of a team? And, like, he, he doesn't realize that there's a time and a place for anything. Like, that's the real him. That's why yeah. I didn't like him. That's why I didn't like him because of, I mean, stuff like that Hall of Fame speech. It's like, dude, how about some graciousness every now and then? He just doesn't have it. Yeah, it's, but, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I care. Like, it's, right. <laughs> if, you're, if you're producing at that level and you have the things that motivate you, they're all going to have it. And maybe, you know, like you have a Peyton Manning or Tom Brady who's not going to mention it. Like, they just don't say it. They're just nicer. And Jordan's not nice. But everybody also always says, like, well, just speak the truth. Don't, like, you know, all this stuff. Well, this dude speaks the truth. And everybody's like, don't speak the truth. Like, we don't, <laughs> you're actually being mean. And you're like, well, you can't. Some are not. Some are. He gives it to you pretty straightforward. And so you got to be like, it is what it is. He just does that. But he backed it up, too, to be the greatest at what he did and the drive. It's not like he was – you know, he put in the work. I mean, you know, he didn't, he wasn't just given this talent and then it wasn't anything, you know, like he just was given this talent and was like, how are you not lucky like me? He, he, he put in the work. I don't like, yeah, I have a weird, like, sometimes I cannot have sympathy for if someone doesn't want to work and they don't want to, and they don't do that. I can, I lose sympathy for them, it, especially in a field like that, like basketball. That's not a regular job. You're not a doctor. You're not like a, a garbage man. You're not like just a regular. You're getting paid uh, usually a lot of money to, and a lot of you get a lot of rewards. So if you are in that world, then, you know, I look at it with us with comedy. So with comedians, you know, no one needs us to be comedians. We're not we're not owed this. No one needs us. No one's sitting here going like, I can't wait to hear what us say about whatever we but we have to prove that we're we have to do something to keep people entertained. So I, I like to re- try to remind myself constantly that like I'm not owed this job. This is a uh, you're you're cha- you're chasing a lottery ticket. Like if we get lucky and this all goes great, then we can possibly make a ton of money and get all the rewards of that. So you have to really work extra hard to get to that level. And so if you're if you have some kind of talent like Jordan did, if you do not put in the extra craziness that makes you be what he became then the other ones are actually robbing other people in the fact that like Jordan's actually, he's earned all his money that he's made. Like, I mean, that dude made himself what he was and he's just, I mean, he's a brand like of Walmart and target. Like this was just a dude, you know, LeBron has built himself up. LeBron, it's shocking that, that, that he is like never really, never had any trouble. It's unbelievable. This dude's been famous since he was 15 he grew up like in a poor place in Cleveland. He is, I mean, there's no reason this dude should not be just already out of the league and like have no money. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible. And the fact that he hasn't done that and he's built everything that he's done, then I, that's unbel- that's unreal, dude. The amount of work that that takes and dedication is nuts to keep himself out of trouble. I mean, dude, these, these guys get in trouble all the time. They just get, situations thrown at them that most people don't and he's handled them all pretty perfectly in it's i mean it's 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 remarkable so i think people will forgive a certain level of people will forgive uh like bad behavior or like a lack of personal virtue if you if you reach a certain level of excellence (laughs) like i've often wondered like yeah, it was really awful that Michael Vick did that shit to dogs. What if Tom Brady had been into dog fighting? Like, I think all of Massachusetts would have found a way to be like, no, well, we don't like dogs. Like, we, we don't yeah. like them that much. You know, he, he brought home the silverware. Yeah, anybody can, if you, if you love something, you can easily kind of be like, I don't know, man. Like, that's, you know, who knows what that's going to be like. So, yeah, it's, it's a unique thing. So I'm doing my, one of my new favorite things to do, and I don't know how healthy this is, 
is to uh, try to pathologize everyone. And so I've been watching, I've been watching the Jordan documentary being like, okay, he's obsessive, definitely obsessive. Um, he maybe has some, 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 I was thinking maybe like cold blooded sociopath, but then he, but then he cries so hard at the first championship. I was like, do sociopaths have that much feeling? So maybe he's just a normal guy that's competitive. I don't think he breaks it down like you're breaking himself down. Like he, you're more worried than he is about himself. You know, like <laughs> there's, it's, 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 I'm just you know, I just talked to someone about this. I don't know if this is good. I know, but you're, he would have never made it with your mentality. And with his <laughs> with his athletic ability and your brain, it would just have been it would it would have been fun. this would be a whole different documentary, dude. I mean, this would be something about his parents or his mom or like well, she didn't do something. I mean, it'd be unwatchable. Uh, but it's they. I, I I don't think they think of that stuff, dude. I think they they don't like you know. There's a. Uh, I have always a weird, I just talked to someone about this, but I always, I'm very weird about like therapy. I, I'm not saying that it's not good or bad or whatever. I, I know people need it for other reasons. I know a lot of comics that do therapy and they've always done it. I, like every, all my best friends do. Uh, but I've always thought it was like weird. There, it just fe- always felt, which, and I'm not saying that I would never not do it or like I'm against it, but I, it just feels very weird to me to like, it's like everything goes back to like uh, your parents and everything like, Everybody's mad at their parents. Now, if your parents are abusive, <laughs> then that's completely, that's completely fine. You, they, you deserve to that, – that person does need therapy if your parents were very brutal to you. But a lot of times it's like, you know, your parents were just trying to get by, man. Like, I don't, like what do you want them to do? Like, they weren't – unless they're actively doing something. And now it's like this little mind game of like, well, my mom – you're trying to go back to these mem- – it's like you're trying to pick your parents apart for everything to then go, that's why I do that. Instead of just being like, maybe you just do that, dude. Like, I don't know. Like, uh, and yeah. I, and I, I, and by the way, I have z- no college education and barely made it out of <laughs> high school. So take, take all this with that. Um, no, that's, I, it's a good point. It's like you break down, this is why I do that because of that. And hopefully then you can change that if you want to change that. But, I mean, yeah, you, what you're saying is you could just change that to begin with on your own. Or you don't change it. And Jordan would be a guy that, I mean, I don't think I would be shocked if it was like he was had a regular therapist and oh, that no. he went to. I there's no be, way he has a therapist. There's no way that he's sitting here telling someone his therapist about Isaiah Thomas. Like he's just talking about <laughs> how he's been, he's been mean to him. He... He worked, you know, he did it in the way of like, uh, after like actions, like he was, oh. you know, as it showed in that thing, he said, I'm getting, this thing is my problem. How do I overcome this problem? And it showed he started working out. He was getting oh, knocked but, over. And so he yeah. worked out. You know what though? A lot of the athletes, almost every, uh, NBA team does have a sports psychologist, which is a sports version of therapy. And every, almost every pro golfer has a, sports psychologist so i think nate would say um, nate would say that they have a mental that, coach what that sports psychologist is trying to do is trying to turn all of them trying to give all those athletes what jordan produces in his own head like that's probably yes. what that psychologist is doing like trying to replicate synthetically create the hormone that jordan is just sweating out of his pores <laughs> naturally because he's the greatest of all time yeah that's what they the uh golfers do mental coaches and to learn how to to keep their but it's i think it's how to keep their focus and how to keep their and i i I get that like it's 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 more of like how to make myself better and look some of this could be i don't even know what therapy is or does or you know i've never done it so uh (laughs) what do i know dude i know nothing so I want, I want a sports psychologist for life. Not a, I don't want a therapist breaking apart my childhood. I want like a mental coach that's going to like show me how to perform better at life. Yeah, that's what yeah. I guess some people that... some people have this reality distortion field, right? That they just somehow are able 
to make the world conform to their will. They can just shape the world and make it be as it should be. And you need a level of talent to even be able to even think about doing that. And of course, Jordan is an incredibly talented athlete. But like, that's why I say that he's a, he has a similar vibe to Trump, that he just like, he, he wills the world and shapes it with his mind at, before he even steps into it. And I, I keep on thinking about like, you know, Jordan very probably like bet on games and that's why he went away. Right, I don't believe people, that, but like that's what you, that's what that's the big a bad. A lot of people are huge. I think it's too hard to keep that a secret. Now they're supposed to talk about that during this, but they, they, like like most conspiracy theories, like and that would be technically one of that him. I just think it's hard to keep that a secret. I don't see why how you, the NBA is not going to put their billion dollar athlete on hold for two years. Like I just think they would figure a way to be like do whatever you want to do, man. You're you're literally the entire league. Uh, you know, so like we can't, I would think that they would do it, but, but that is an enormous thing that I, uh, good friends of mine argued with me about. They think that he completely left because of that reason. Right. Like, yeah, it was just for completely normal reasons that he left the league. At well, his the dad was his murdered. <laughs> well, his right. Dad, yeah. His dad was murdered. So but that was, then, I mean, that I'd imagine that. That's not good. But you, you look uh, at the difference between how he was treated and Pete Rose was treated, and the difference is that Pete Rose admitted it, right? So, like, let's assume for a second that Jordan well, gambles. I know you don't accept that, but, like, so, like, the difference is that Pete Rose admits it, and all of a sudden... I said that he gambles completely. Right. The, the, the reality distortion field falls apart because he admits he did something wrong. But Jordan and Trump have this thing in common where they're like, no, nah, I didn't do nothing. No, no. And, it, Tom, it, like, we believe Tom, it. If I if my dad was murdered, I would probably do something different for two years as well. <laughs> right? Right. I mean, it's, right. if your dad's yeah, murdered, I mean, you're going to It was right then. Some... Well, and the, another theory is they have that his dad was murdered because of his gambling. But, I mean, this is the 90s. Like, I don't, you know, it's not, the mob was not, like, just killing people. You know, you're not going to just go kill George. I don't know how much gambling debt he could have got into, but it seems... It just seems very crazy that it would have had to happen. But I agree. I don't think Pete Rose, Pete Rose should be in the league. I do think Jordan gambled, and I'm not even sure. He probably gambled on the, the games. I, I have no idea about that. I'm not, against, I'm not against the idea of him gambling, but I don't think he was – the NBA said you got to leave for two, uh, two years. I don't think it was that you know, much of a thing. And you know what he talked about, too, about visualizing. What's funny is that's what golf – that's what another thing golf is. Golf is so important – to visualize your shot. It's the only thing that, I mean, it's actually kind of helped me in like just life where if you're like, I want something and you start picturing like, that's the secret, you know, which is, uh, it, but it's the, the one thing the secret has about it is like, yeah, if you visualize and think I want this thing and I want this thing and your in your mindset is trying to get this thing, whatever your accomplishment is, it works. And in golf is like, you visualize the shot. So the guy's, when you visual, visualize a shot and that shot happens, it's the most rewarding feeling in the world because it's immediate that you go like, that's what I wanted that ball to do. And you got to really, you got to picture it. You got to be convinced that you know how to do this. And when you don't do that, the ball can go anywhere because you're, you're kind of just swinging a club at a ball. You're not thinking about what it's going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Visualization, visualization is so big for golf. Yeah. I wondered, I always wondered if that applied to like your day, if you could just wake up and really visualize your day really hard and then make it happen. So that's why, that's one of the things I do in the morning because probably because of golf, but I don't, I don't know how well, I don't know how well that visualization applies beyond about 30 seconds from it from it happening well you gotta you gotta follow through you gotta visualize i think it does work in your careers and what you want to go do and if you picture like that you want to i don't know you want to be at this stage i mean in comedy you know i've tried to visualize a lot of things and but i think my you know like my goals have always been i've always had goals that i can get to like and then they just change so at the beginning my goal was to not hand out flyers on the side of a corner i wasn't thinking i want an hbo special I just didn't want to be on that corner, standing in the cold, handing out flyers. You, I, you just got to have goals. I think people put goals that are too big, 
and then it's you it's you're too far away from reaching it and so then you're never going to get to that to that well, goal i want to ask you about your writing because i noticed uh in the last maybe five five years it seemed like when you started doing jimmy fallon a lot it felt like to me your writing kind of exploded with new material and i was wondering if if your writing was always like that and i had just noticed it or if uh you had started some new writing technique no i don't i mean i don't have one like uh i get very I, i've been nervous of not having a writing technique is uh I'm scared of not being able to produce. So I, I think a lot of it's based in fear of just thinking every joke you write, you think that's the last one you're ever going to come up with. And so you just live in constant fear and it just ends up, you know, and I can go through spurts. I mean, like when I'm in a panic of like when a special comes out and I know that I got to turn over material and have new material by the time because people are going to start coming. There's just like a panic that sets in. And I think your brain just shifts to like, you're just trying to find stuff and you're trying to uh, come up with stuff and like just new ideas. I do it. Like if I need wife material, I kind of like, again, this is a kind of visualizing, but I'll, I kind of think like I need some wife stuff. And I think I just become a little more aware of like relationship ideas and, or if I need children stuff, you know? So, so you're saying you don't, experience pleasure when you're writing a lot of new material <laughs> no dude it's i mean you know i just did recently like actually yeah when i i came uh and i sat and wrote some stuff down on my phone i wrote it out more than i ever usually do uh i always like i never wrote it out word for word and it was a big part because of like i always heard patrice o'neill and bill burr they, they were both huge comics for me bill burr being probably the most uh, cause I was in New York in 2004. I saw, I went to their HBO one night stand taping. I saw Burr's kind of entire rise to like, he, I was barking on a corner when he was in, he was going to go do his first letterman. And I remember like accidentally handing him a flyer and I was like, I'm so sorry. And he was doing a le his first letterman. And so I was very close to watching, you know, not, I mean, I've got to know him now, uh, but and become friends with them, which is great. But like back, I've just always been kind of in the sideline. Just always, I went to Caroline's when it wasn't sold out. Then I went to Caroline's and it was sold out. I went to town hall. I just, he was like a guy that I just watched, like kind of come up and they would always talk about writing stuff word for word. And if you do that, you can sound too scripted and not like it's a conversation. And so I would always just kind of write the bullet points of what I'm trying to get to. And I think about it a lot. And then you just got to say it in front of people. Uh, I tend to like to open with my new stuff because it's most excited. And then sometimes I'll move it around. I'll move it around sometimes just because if the middle chunk, if I'm kind of tired of saying, you kind of put a new thing towards the end, just so you're like, can I, you're like excited to get to that new thing. Because, you know, you got to give that off. Like you got to give. One thing I've learned with the Jordan thing is like being in the moment, like really like, you know, when you go on stage and you just can phone it in and you're thinking about a million other things and it can come off and the audience can tell, you know, they're just like, you're not in it. You're like, you can kind of forget where you're at in the joke and you're just like repeating lines. So you got to sometimes do stuff to make yourself like really, I don't know, appreciate where you're at and like give these people a real show, you know? So what you're, what I'm hearing about your writing or not so much writing is kind of like, I kind of picture you, what I would call a, you're like tuning in your awareness and then almost like, I would call it like a research based writing where you're like, I'm going to go study what's going on between me and my wife for the next few months. Yeah, it's exactly, I mean, it's exactly, it's just like kind of telling yourself, Hey, you need to come up with this. I mean, sometimes it's even like, I have, I'll feel I have too much wife stuff. And I'm like, I don't want it. I want something silly now. I want some silly things, you know, like your, you know, like your wolf's joke with the teeth and like the, it's like, if you want something like, but you want something like that, that's just very fun and funny. And like, it's, it's just, so you kind of like start thinking, like, I just want some things that are like, not, that are just going to be fun to tell. Like, the, you know, it's but not as personal. I think you do what, I think you do what Seinfeld does, which is you'll just like go 
try like a shooting range or you'll go to the serpentarium and you'll kind of be yeah. taking notes. I think you'll, you're kind of like taking notes in your head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You just do that. You go, you do go and do things is the number one thing. Have an experience. That's when comics, like some comics that are very young, like if you're talking to like a 16 year old that wants to start and like the advice yeah. to them is like, go to high school and college and like you, the, you need experiences. You can't just, skip like everything because then you're like who are you going to be talking to like who is going to relate to what you're you're doing you know and so you gotta you want to be i i like to think I you want to be relatable you want to be going through these same experiences i noticed a lot of people in my audience or a lot of them have a kid or a lot of them are married you know it's you end up kind of having an audience that's you that their version of you and so you gotta like you got to do those kind of things that, you know, that they go, I don't know, that people go do and like talk about that stuff. And, and, uh, my last comedy question is, um, if you have been a, a stage hound in the last four or five years, or if you've mostly just been doing, um, your theater shows. Uh, most of my theater shows that went away. I mean, I was, a I was nuts in New York. I went out every night and then, uh, when I started doing the road, I mean, you, now you're doing, I mean, I have to stay on the road. I'm doing, you know, hundred some shows a year and I'll occasionally go do them. But if I go to New York and I go run, you know, if I have a tonight show or something, I'll go to New York and run a bunch of spots. And, but when you start, when you start doing an hour, these shows where they need to be an hour and 15, you got to just like learn how to do that. And you got to, and that's actually been, I've written the most when, I've been on the road for this hour because there's not as much pressure. Like you're, you know, when you're doing 12 minutes, like in New York, like you got to make them laugh now. Like you, you know, it's like, you don't have time. And when you've got an hour and 15, I can throw in some new stuff here and there. And I'm never, you know, you're, you can always get Like I can try something new because I'm not scared of losing them and then losing them for the entire set. I will always be able to get them back. And I just place stuff where I need to play stuff. Uh, so it's like now that it's just been doing, it's, it's really just been doing the road. And I feel, I feel the fulfillment. I don't, you know, I don't feel like I'm not working. I feel very much like I'm working. I work, I try to stay on the road as much as I can just to keep doing it. And, you know, it just, I don't know. It's like just moving stuff around and, uh, you know, I, and everything that I come up with, I never understood, you know, like you ever go like do a open mic in a town that's like the town you're working, you're working a club. And then later on you go to some alt show in that city. Yeah. Like I never like everything that I'm doing is everything that I have right now. I never have like 20 jokes just sitting on the sideline waiting to get in. Like I put everything out. And if, if, if it's not working, then it's just out. Like it's gone. Like, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I could revisit it some other time. Sometimes I find a way to bring it back in. But I mean, I kind of like everything I come up with is what's what's being used. I don't ever have I don't have a surplus of just material <laughs> like I don't have 40 minutes just sitting in a folder a, that I'm like, a, you don't have Google Docs full of extra jokes. I, no, it's it's all I mean, I live I live check by check. I That's mean, it's, a, it's all all or nothing. Well, that makes sense. That means you're focused on the uh, the set at hand. Um the, the last thing I'm dying to ask you is uh, I just think it's so funny that your dad, you grew up with your dad being a clown and then a magician, and now you sometimes do shows with him, I guess. And I just wonder, like, there's nothing more different that I would guess there's nothing more different than your style of comedy than from a clown. But at the same time, you, at the same time, you kind of have the same life as your dad. And I was just curious if you to relate to each other a lot or you feel like you're in two different worlds we we do so he goes out with me a bunch and i think uh eventually he'll go out i mean he still has like a day job and he's always done he's always done magic and he's done very good at it and uh, but he's always like had a job too and he had a job that like could do both uh so once he retires from that job i think he'll go out with me even more but i you know i think i see more stuff now than I did than I realized back then. I think uh, a lot of my timing and stuff is it comes from him. I mean, he's our acts are completely different, and he does he's always done comedy with his magic. Uh, 
So when he comes out with me on the road, I mean, he destroys. So when he comes, he gets a response, too, because I've talked about in these specials. When they introduce him, I mean, dude, it's like Seinfeld's coming out. I mean, they – you know, in Chattanooga, they gave him a standing ovation when he walked out. I mean, it was just they it, they were they were because we don't announce it. And it's like a surprise. And so and then he comes out and just I mean, people lose it. Dude. People tell me like they're like, I mean, you were great, but you're dead. Like they're just so blown away because they you know, I think they assume as I would assume if someone's like my dad's coming out, you'd be like, oh, God, we got to sit to this guy's dad like. You know, you're like, I don't want to, it's like bringing your family out. You're like, here's my daughter. She's going to come out and do tell a funny joke. And you're like, dude, don't waste. We paid money for this ticket. Like, yeah. but he puts on such a good show. So I feel like the relief of how good he is and how excited they are when they see him. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's very fun to get to do it now together. No wonder you don't want to go to therapy. You your therapist is going to be like, so your dad was a clown. <laughs> I mean, just pick me apart. That's what there is a little bit of me that I think I'm scared of that of with therapy is like, I'm scared to, uh, you know, it was like when you stop, I stopped drinking and you know, when you stop drinking, you're like, well, I can't stop drinking. That's what makes me funny. You think that, and then you stop drinking. Cause you're like, that's that what had nothing to do with why like I'm funny or not. And so, like, there is a part of me that with therapy, I tend to, like, I'm very nervous that they're going to just break me down. And then I'm just, like, a different, <laughs> miserable, unfunny. Like, I'm just, like, I don't know. I'm just, I end up just telling people how to be positive in their life on stage. And, like, it's just a nightmare. Like, you're like, you're oh, afraid. this guy. And <laughs> you're afraid therapy is going to make you happier and therefore less funny. Exactly. I mean, that's isn't that the fear of all of it? I mean, I knew that your dad was a was a magician, but I, I didn't know that he's actually also a, a clown as well. So he, he was a, he he was he's a legit clown. When I was a kid, when right. I that that and then so my first album is called Yelled Out by a Clown is a picture of me, and my dad, when I was five, and so he was a clown, uh, and I talked about his my act like he was like till I was like ten, and I have another special called Full Time Magic. And I'd say that because he's he, then he went to full time magic. And so he doesn't he hasn't been a clown in, uh, I mean, out of 30 years or something. Because so, I'm learning. A, I'm learning a lot about clowns right now because my daughter has just turned two. So she's watching a lot of Sesame Street. Yeah. And Mr. Noodle is on Sesame Street. I'm sure you're familiar. Yeah. Uh, haven't had kids. And he's Mr. Noodle. The original Mr. Noodle is played by this guy, Bill Irwin, who is this celebrated clown, like a trained clown and you watch him and you just go like this is so funny and it's so funny that it's making me laugh and two-year-old girl laugh that's a special magic that that person possesses and you, you makes you filled with respect for like the art of it yeah it's i mean look having once you have kids man it's a whole you look at all this stuff i mean you look at like disney movies and pixar movies it's so impressive how they can you can watch it with your children and you can really laugh and they're very funny and like it's, 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 it's a very unique thing. And it's something that once you have a family, like you realize like how much family uh, stuff, I don't know, you, cause just cause it's like, it's getting harder and harder to do stuff with your kids. And as your kids get older, they don't want to, you know, my mom and daughter is seven. So she's still a little girl, but they, you know, you see kids with like teenage daughters and like, I mean, they're dead. Uh, there's, there's not much they can be doing with them that they want to do or they, you know, so when you have stuff like that and that, that can, you can watch that where you like it and your two year old likes it. Yeah. That's a special, that's a special type of talent, you know, like that, that person's doing that's uh, unbelievable. Was there a moment doing stand up that your dad was like, um, really, uh, super like, Oh, you're, you're doing it. You're doing what I was. It was there a time when he was doubting you and then a time where it shifted or was he always super supportive of stand up? They were always super supportive. I mean, he loved that. I was doing oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, something in this and he did comedy with his magic always. So he was always, they, my parents, I mean, they wasted so much money and all these dumb, you know, bringer shows or contests I had to submit for. And my dad would, my dad was, he introduced me to Brian Regan. He, he bought a Brian Regan CD uh, at a truck stop and listened <laughs> to it and called me. I'll never forget. I was in Chicago 
And when I first started, it was 2003, and he, like, called me. And I, was, I remember being on the sidewalk, and he was like, I had to pull over because uh, I was laughing so hard. And I didn't really know. Brian Regan was the first comic I ever saw that I didn't understand how he was not the most famous comedian out of everybody. I, like, I didn't yeah. – I couldn't, like, rap. You're like, why is he not – he should be everything. And uh, so, like, he, he was, like, loved – he bought me tickets. I saw Brian Regan at a comedy club in Chicago – Saw him in Caroline's in New York, uh, and my dad bought me tickets. So they were always just pumping That's money awesome. to me, like to go to stuff, and uh, you know, not like they, they didn't have a ton of money, but they would all whatever they could give me to make sure, because I was like, I got to go do this. I think they could see that I loved this thing, and I loved doing it, so they loved that. Well, from what I've seen of, uh, from what I've observed of Brian, your writing styles are very similar. He just goes on stage with the bullet points, you know, but they don't, and then he'll sometimes listen to his sets afterwards. I've never done that. I've, <laughs> I've tried, I've recorded. Uh, yeah. You know, the only time I will now is luckily I've been recording some of my sets now. And for this, for what's happened, because I had a kind of a new hour built. And so I'll probably go back and listen. You know, I would watch like, I'll watch my special when I go back through or something, or like, I'll watch it tonight show when I do it. Uh, like once and then uh, but I'll go back and listen to these sets just because I need to make sure that you know we're having so much time off just to make sure that you're not yeah. missing anything I found it's so helpful to grow in your set to listen to your set and yet so painful for me to listen to my set that I still don't want to do it <laughs> it's I mean it's it's the hard I, I I see the benefit of it so much and it's like, it is, dude, it's brutal. It's hearing your voice and you're just like, you know, cause you already like, you know, sometimes when you go on stage and you're like, why are these people even here? This is, you feel like it's a scam. Like you're, you're like, there's no reason they should be here. And yeah. this is absurd yeah, you that just, people drove here. Like, yeah, you know, just been this, eating granola bars for the last 30 minutes or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Just not, I mean, just, and you're just like, this is a joke, dude. Like I, I've always felt that, and uh, but I always think you need that. You need like some, you know. I was like, you know, in like in so in, like basketball, we're talking about Jordan. Like it's very pumped up. You got to be pumped up before you go out, and it's it's like, all right, we're doing it. You know, golf is very positive. You sh you're supposed to be very positive when you're doing it, and comedy is the only thing that like right before you go out there, I think you got to have the mindset of like this this could go real bad, and that's how you got to enter that stage <laughs> with just. I mean, yeah. being like, ah, this, I don't know. I don't know. And then you just start talking because it's like better to come from that angle than it is to come from a confident angle. Like, you know, just come from yeah. like, a, you're just hoping. It really is a completely different mindset from competing in an athletic event. So it's such a different mindset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Like, you know, you hear, you hear basketball players go, you know, I just want to, stay confident you know just know that i'm the best shooter that's out there and it's like comedy it's like you almost if you think you if you think you're gonna do bad you're almost funnier <laughs> yeah if you you i always like you don't want any pressure so you're trying to like just i assume the worst and then we yeah. go I, that's my starting point is the worst well i'm happy to hear that you have great supportive parents because Tom and I do as well, and and now this you know this doesn't give us any excuses. I'm happy to hear there's people doing well with supportive parents, because I only hear about the the ones that are trying to the ones that are mad at their parents and messed them up. So now they're now they're hilarious because they're so messed up. That's another big fear. Like that was a uh, that's something I always you know you're scared of where you're like, well, I didn't have this crazy childhood where it you know I didn't I didn't grow up with just this like everything was bad and whatever and I was I, it made you it made me nervous that you're like well you know I mean I didn't we we didn't definitely didn't have any money you know my parents had no money when I was a kid uh but it, you know but I never money was never important you know we just never thought about it uh everybody was poor where we were from so but yeah they were loving parents that you know fault like normal parents there's nothing crazy but yeah that was the thing you're always worried like are you supposed to because it's always talked about comics have this mentality of just yeah their parents were the worst and like they comedy was the only way they got through it and you're like i don't have any of that stuff but you know i always go back to seinfeld i don't think seinfeld had that 
Yeah. There's plenty. It, it turns out parents loved him. Turns out there's plenty of creative people with with good childhoods. <laughs> um, well, awesome, yeah. <laughs> Tom. Is there anything else you want to ask Nate? I want to ask about why you're a Vandy fan. Uh, yeah. So I just growing up in Nashville. We before the Titans, the NFL team was here. All we had was uh, college sports in the South. Uh, college is very big, and college sports are huge. And so I had a cousin that coached at Vandy, and then my mom worked at Vandy. And so we grew up just kind of in the world of Vandy. And so Vandy just became um, – I loved them, and uh, I've watched them my whole life. And they're, it's a, they're, it's a, it can be a tough time to root for Vandy. I mean, they – you know, we had a women's – we've won two women's bowling championships. So the fact <laughs> that I have to know that <laughs> – like, I mean, if you're an Ohio State fan, you don't know how the women's bowling team is doing. But in Vandy, you're like, we're doing real good, man, because everybody's terrible. And so it's uh, – I like rooting for a team that's not – I think it builds character uh, to not just be – like all these – you know, a lot of kids that grew up in the 90s, they were all Bulls, Cowboys, and Yankees fans. And, like, they never had any – like, every sport they loved was just, like, they won a championship in something. Or if you're on a Patriots run, like, if you're born when they start winning – I mean, dude, the Red Sox, them, the Bruins, like, they all won. Like, uh, I think the Celtics – did the Bruins win? They won, right? They – you know, like, they've yeah. just – there could be a stretch where a kid could have 20 years where, I mean, he's never had one of his teams win a championship. So it's good to have, you know, if you're like a diehard Cubs fan, I mean, that reward when they won, I mean, that had to be, there's nothing better than that. You wait all these years, your whole life, they don't win. And then yeah. they finally win a championship. I mean, that that's better than if you were a Bulls fan and saw them win six in a row, like, or not six in a row, but six, you know, three, two, three peats. Yeah, I grew up rooting for the for the Cleveland team. So whenever anybody asks me who my football team is, I have to say the Browns. And then they always say, why? And I'm like, well, you know, because eventually they'll do well and it'll be amazing. It will be. I mean, when when the when the Cavs won, I mean, my yeah. goodness, dude, like it's that has it made to my be, year. It may. Yeah. I mean, it's the most it's just got to feel so good that you're like, I can't believe they won. I didn't think I'd ever see this. <laughs> and that 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 feeling for, for that victory, I think, is better than a feeling of, you know, dominance. Yeah. I, I love the idea that there's this name and this family that's these two very different things. So Cornelius Vanderbilt is one of the most New York of New York people, like way back in the 19th century. And yet he has this huge footprint of his descendants that are all very southern, like extremely yeah. southern, like this very, oh, you yeah. know, the real deal. And the Biltmore, um, the Biltmore is in Asheville, North Carolina. That's southern. I was just yeah. going to talk about That's the Biltmore estate. Southern as well. Yeah, because I drove down through um, North Carolina and I went to Asheville and me and my wife and I went, we were going to go to the Biltmore estate and then we pulled up and... The, it's so expensive to go look at this rich man's house. Yeah. It's seventy ninety dollars with the audio Nin with the audio tour. It's ninety. I mean, yeah. and it's <laughs> like they're so smart. They like they figured out it's like it's ten bucks cheaper on a Tuesday, but like the other days, it's they know exactly the the point at which you'll walk away and you'll go, okay, I'll pay for it. And we didn't pay for it because it does feel like a rich man's trick, doesn't it? Like, wait, you're paying them with. <laughs> I'm paying oh, ninety dollars to see this sure. really rich man's house, and then you're like, "Oh, that's why you have a big house, because you're making me pay ninety bucks to go see it." Uh, yeah, oh. I'm amazed at. Do you know he's buried in Staten Island? <laughs> Cornelius Vanderbilt. Oh, that Vanderbilt? broke up the whole the whole your whole speech was just. Oh no, rats! Yeah. Well, it was it was very compelling and brilliant actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I look everybody just like. I'm gonna have to go back and rewatch this just to see that part of it. <laughs> I've been to that. I went um, to the Biltmore too. I, I went. I went and saw it, uh, that house. I don't remember. I don't think I paid for the audio. Like I, you know, I did all that. But I, I think it wore a Vanderbilt hat. Just you know, just let them know. Just support. 
Are there any are there any Vandy alumni's who've gone pro in professional sports? Jay Cutler, uh, Will Perdue, mm -hmm. who's in The Last Dance, was at Vanderbilt. Oh, nice. uh, but you know, the mean thing that Jordan did, he said his last name was Perdue because he, that's only his, that, that's his, he was like good as Purdue or something. Or no, he shouldn't have had a name. His last name should be Purdue because he wasn't as good as uh, their conference or something. He's like very mean to Will Purdue. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, again, I'm going back to, yeah, Jordan. Yeah, he was a mean guy. Well, so we got it. We got to get off and watch episode five of The Last Dance. I know we can find. Um, I want to direct all of our listeners to both of your Netflix specials, which are terrific. Um, is there anything else anywhere anywhere else we uh, we should find you aside from the golf course? No, I mean it's all on. You know, yeah, all out there, and it's all yeah. Social media and they got see all that. Tour is supposed to start back up in August, hopefully. So we'll see if that happens, and uh, that's it. Man. Oh yeah, this was this was the weekend. It was going to be my first week uh, working with you. I was excited, man. Uh, we had a, you would have golfed. We had done some good golfing. Uh, so, but you're 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 still be coming back out when we get it all. If it all starts Sweet. going, I'll have been, nice uh, golf lined up for us. I've been I've been practicing in Astoria Park, right next to my apartment. You go out there and just swing. I just swing. That's all I got. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on. It was great to see you. That was awesome. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was great. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, and we always end the podcast with, uh, if you made it this far, you're one of the greats. So you're welcome to join us. Um, guys, if you made it this far, you are one you're of the greats. one of the greats. Great. Oh, I say it too. You're one of the greats. <laughs> yeah. And then the music goes on and then we're out. That was a great listening experience. If you're still listening, you're one of the greats. Hashtag branding, hashtag marketing.